He's not known in the city streets. There's nothing about his face or appearance that would draw others to him. He lives as one without a home, migrating from hill to hill. He is as weathered and hard as the stony hills of Judea on which he tends his flock. His sheep know him. They recognize his face, follow his voice, respond to his touch. In the morning, he leads them out to green pastures. In the heat of the day, he rests them beside still waters. In the evening, he counts them, calling each one by name, attending to their wounds with oil and comfort. At night, he lies down in the mouth of the sheepfold, his body becoming the door, the only source of protection against the elements and enemies outside. His eyes are keen, able to scan the horizon by day and penetrate the darkness by night. His ears are sharp, alert to the sound of danger and the individual cry of a wandering sheep. His shoulders are strong, bearing the burden of the young and the weak who can no longer bear the journey. It is to him the angels come. It is to him the message is given, and he responds. Through the little town that knows not his name, from house to house he moves, bearing the burden of love, willing to share it with those who will listen. A savior has been born, a shepherd who will give his life for his sheep, a lamb who will give his life for the shepherds. For the child of the stable is the shepherd of love. Yeah, thank you for your help with this. And it's just a reminder of what we have done, who we are, by nature and what God has offered us. So let's turn to our message this morning, uh, and our passage is the um, book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, so feel free to follow along in your Bible, otherwise it will be printed up here on the screen if you prefer to follow along. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, the king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For, you, for from you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I, may, I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went on ahead of them until it came to stop over the place where the child was to be found. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after they came into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And after being warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now let me ask you a question. Is there such a thing as the perfect Christmas gift? <coughs> I would assume that if anyone in here had received it, you would have gotten up here a few minutes ago and shared that. But have you ever thought for months, planned for weeks, gotten everything together for what you knew would be the perfect gift for someone? You were so excited that you could hardly wait for them to open it. But maybe it didn't turn out to be so perfect. For example, you plan to have a photograph of all of your grandkids, of all of the grandkids, excuse me, in their most precious Christmas clothes. It'll be the perfect gift for grandma. 
But when you go to have the photograph made, little Johnny won't sit still. Andy has pulled the bow out of his sister's hair. The one that you went to the hair beautician for and paid $16. You promised Johnny things that you have no intention of giving him if he will just sit still for one minute. You finally struggle to get the bow back in Betty's hair, but you have to settle for a ponytail. Finally, all is going well. Just before the photographer's flash, the baby throws up. <laughs> if you've had kids, you've probably had some kind of experience like that. So, is it just me or does it sometimes seem like Christmas is as much work and pain as a two pound chicken laying a three pound egg? Maybe it is just me. Maybe I'm the only one who's ever thought, man, that ring sure looked bigger in the store. Or you look at the things that you give to your spouse and you think, it doesn't look like much stuff now, but it sure seemed like a whole lot when I was paying for it. Maybe I'm the only one who's ever walked through the mall four times still having no clue what to buy. Maybe I'm the only one who's been promising for the last 10 years, next year I'm going to start shopping before December. How do you know when you find the perfect gift? What requirements does it have to meet? Does it have to have a certain carat weight? Does it have to come from a particular store? or have a specific designer's name on it. Also, who decides the perfect gift? Is it the giver or the receiver? So this morning I want to talk to you about the perfect Christmas gift. Now you're sitting there thinking, I just spent some time telling you that I have no idea what the perfect gift is, and now I'm going to preach about it? That seems a little bit like asking Napoleon to pontificate about the dangers of being tall. Or LeBron James being uh, told to, to give a seminar on how to survive with a limited income. Or Bill Clinton on honesty. Before you get testy and negative, I want you to know that I am not speaking from personal experience or of my own wisdom. I have expert advice in determining what the per perfect gift is is. So who is my source? It's God. Now you may be thinking, the Bible doesn't say anything about choosing the perfect gift. Maybe you've been hunting these last few Decembers trying to figure it out. But Scripture does give us great guidelines about what we have to learn from the Master. There are four principles that we can learn from examining God's perfect gift, perfect present from in Jesus Christ. And so my sermon in a sentence this week is this. The perfect presence of Jesus is found in the presence of Jesus. The first thing, the first component of the perfect present is this. The perfect gift is a personal gift. In John 3.16, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, you could be like me in many years and wait until the last minute possible before you buy your wife a gift. But when she opens it up and sees that it is a team logo, refillable mug, she's going to know that you went to Walmart or somewhere the night before. And you can't fool her with that card when you scratch out happy birthday and wrote in Merry Christmas. If a gift is going to be appreciated, I see those smiles, I think there are people out there that have done it, right? <laughs> uh, if a gift's going to be appreciated, it's got to be, if it's going to be a real bell ringer, if you want to get that response that you're looking for, it takes thought. It needs to take consideration of the person, their likes, their dislikes their personality, 
their needs, their interests. I shouldn't just run to my closet Christmas Eve and pull out new hair clippers for Emily. I don't think she'd use those. A gift needs to be personal, reflecting their personality. Or maybe giving them something of yourselves. Years ago, my dad, who was a teacher, but he also spent a majority of his lifetime working construction, he gave me a set of sawhorses. He knew that I needed them. He knew how I liked carpentry. Oh, by the way, they were handmade. He had poured his own sweat and labor in them. Now that is a personal gift. Of course, there may have been a little bit of selfishness in him. You see, my dad was tired of me borrowing his horses and sawing them in half. And when God sent his Christmas gift, it was personal. It was God's own personal son. His only son. The son that he loved. But it was more than that. It was God himself in the flesh. And it was tailor-made for you personally. He came to die for your sins. He came to die for my sins. The sins that you personally committed. And he came to bring personal forgiveness, personal salvation, and personal peace. God didn't just pull an angel off the shelf and send it saying, well, I just feel like I have to give them something. No. God spent time considering our personal needs, our sin, and our separation, thinking of the best way to save us. And he came up with this idea. I will go to them personally and pay their price personally. Jesus was the perfect gift, and the perfect gift is a personal gift. Secondly, the perfect gift is a practical gift. In Romans chapter 3, and kind of combined with 6.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And for that, the wages of sin is death. Now, nothing personal, please don't take offense to this, but what did the bald man say when he received a comb for Christmas? He said, boy, when they handed out brains, you were in the back of the line, weren't you? For a gift to be any good, it has to be useful. It has to be something that the receiver would, would use that they would like. The more useful, the better. So I could give my kids toys this year. That would be useful. But what I wouldn't give them is their own brand new set of sharp kitchen knives and a cutting board. Have you ever gotten a gift for someone so out of character, so unlike you that you immediately thought, or that you received, excuse me, that was so out of character for you that you thought, Here's another one for the gift pile that I'll just give away at the earliest opportunity. One year I received this book. Now don't get me wrong, I love books. But this one wasn't working for me. When God sent his perfect gift, it was practical. There was nothing more we needed. Now, in Romans 3 and Romans 6, verses 23, that we referenced a minute ago, it says, We had all committed sins, and the result of this was that it separated us from the love and mercy of God, and we were destined for hell. We were trapped in our own swamps of sin, unable to help ourselves, because this is all we had to offer. We were all dying a slow death. And yet Jesus knew, or God, excuse me, God knew what we needed. What we needed more than anything else is what he gave us. Not another ritual, not another commandment, not another prophet. We needed a redeemer. Someone to come and buy us back from hell. Someone who could pay our price so that we would not have to. And that came, the only one that fits that perfectly, 
is Jesus. I thank God each and every day that he took the time to consider my needs, to care about my needs, and then that he loved me enough that he was willing to give past the point of comfort, past the point of ease. He was willing to give a gift that cost him dearly. Jesus is the perfect gift because he is a personal gift, he is a practical gift, and he is also a pleasing gift. In Psalm 107, verse 9, we read, For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Now the perfect gift is one that satisfies a person. There is a longing in each of our hearts, saved or free, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now some have described this feeling as like a, we each have a God-shaped hole. Perhaps you've heard people talk about that. I've heard many people over the years. Nothing can seem to fill that hole as much as we try, except Jesus Christ. He is the right gift. His only begotten Son to fill that hole. He's the perfect gift because he's personal, he's practical, and he's a pleasing gift. And finally, the perfect gift is a permanent gift. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, we read, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, I remember some of the gifts that did not make it through Christmas Day. Like a remote control car that made one trip around the room and then died. Or walkie-talkies that never spoke a single Roger over and out. A model car that was missing a tire. G.I. Joe, whose arm fell off. I have other presents that lasted longer, but they eventually rusted or broke, or wore out. Still others lasted a long time. They never had a problem. I just outgrew them. My stuffed animals, a tricycle, a Tonka truck, and all of those clothes that quickly were out of date, out of style. The perfect gift would be one that would never break Never be outgrown or outdated. One that would always be needed. Always be satisfying and desirable. And one that would last longer than we do. We know that all earthly treasures have a period of time. When God sent his perfect gift, it was permanent. He sent his love, his forgiveness, his mercy, his presence his strength, his help, his guidance. Jesus Christ is an eternal gift God will never take back, even though we are undeserving and often ungrateful. Even if we blow it, even if we abandon him, God does not give us expecting us to give back. When he acts, it is eternal. When we are eternally saved, eternally His, eternally, forever, no end. Now how many gifts have you ever known that fit all four requirements? A personal gift, a practical gift, a pleasing gift, and a permanent gift. How many of the gifts that you have bought this year will fit all four? Well, when you are shopping, if you are not done yet, and I'm sure if you're like me that you're not finished, remember these requirements for the perfect gift. And then, when you are thinking of a gift to buy someone, maybe you will be reminded of one of these four characteristics of the perfect gift. And if you do, offer a prayer of thanks to God for giving us the greatest, most perfect gift 
we have ever received. And so we are reminded this morning that the perfect presence of Jesus is found in the presence of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this week of, of Christmas, Lord, and, and we admit that our minds and our thoughts often get cluttered with the busyness of this season, of gifts to be bought and given, of parties uh, to attend, of family to, um, to speak to, to love, um, the lights to be able to still go and, and see the thoughts and wonders that we see, the, the twinkling in the eyes of, of our kids and grandkids as we think about um, the presents that are to be unwrapped. And yet, Lord, too often we let this clutter get in the way of what the perfect gift was. Lord, help us this season to be reminded of the gift that you gave us through your Son. And Lord, that it is such a perfect gift that we can have and we can also share. Lord, help us not to cling too tightly to this gift and leave others looking in from outside. Lord, help us to share the truth of the gift of your Son and all that that entails. We thank you for your willingness to give in a way that was costly, in a way that none of us would find desirable, Lord, and yet we see through it that your plan from the very dawn and even before the dawn of time is perfectly laid out. Help us to trust you in everything that we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and then we'll have our closing song. Be a people of love. Let love live in your heart and share the love of Christ with all that you meet. Share love by loving those you see on a regular basis. Start by loving your community. Share love by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share love. As you prepare to go back out into the wonder of God's creations, share love and joy and peace and hope with all whom you meet. Amen.